All right. So it sounds like we are officially live here for Cocktails and Fishtails this evening. Hello, everybody out there. Welcome aboard. My name is Carly, and I'm the communication specialist with Harbor Wild Watch. For those of you who might not be familiar with Cocktails and Fishtails, it's our science social series. It's generally held monthly, and these programs feature a scientist, researcher, or environmental artist on an ecological topic. While these programs are traditionally 21 plus and held at a local tap room or venue during the pandemic, we have shifted them to an online format for all ages and locations. And this has also opened us up for really cool opportunities like this one to have guest presenters from different areas than our own Pacific Northwest backyard to talk about really cool topics. So if you're just tuning in, let us know where you are tuning in from in the comments and perhaps what you are drinking this evening because it is cocktails and fish shells after all. Um, for tonight's program, I am very excited to have Tom Ford, Chief Executive Officer for the Bay Foundation joining us. A little bit about Tom and the Bay Foundation. Tom has spent the past 20 years advancing the science and developing a broad community to restore kelp forests off of Los Angeles, California. His other current efforts involve method development for the restoration and recovery of abalone and offshore eelgrass restoration, amongst many other fantastic projects. When he's not working, Tom enjoys surfing, ocean swimming, scuba diving, and mountain biking. The Bay Foundation began kelp forest restoration in 2013 to reduce urchin population density and allow the recovery of giant kelp. The submarine forests off of Southern California coasts are known to be some of the most diverse and productive ecosystems in the world. They provide habitat and food for over 700 species of algae, invertebrates, and fish. And Tom will definitely, of course, talk about um, more, more along the lines of the loss of the kelp canopy on this coastline and then what the Bay Foundation has done to help restore it. A little bit on format, we'll have a Q&A after Tom's presentation, so I encourage everyone who's tuning in to ask questions along the way, comment as well, or just save them until the very end of our presentation, and Tom will answer them after his presentation is through. If you aren't watching this live and you're watching on YouTube, you can always email us any burning questions at info at harborwildwatch.org. Without further ado, I'm going to stop talking and pass it over to Tom to talk about kelp restoration. Tom, floor is yours. Oh, thank you, Carly, and what a wonderful welcome, and uh, hello, everybody out there. How's my volume coming through well? Volume's great. Super. Um, in, inspired by Cocktails and Fishtails, uh, one of my favorite breweries is up the road in Ventura, California, uh, called Made West. I'll be sipping on a, on a pale ale um, lightly this evening because obviously I've got some work to do here. Uh, but um, I'm excited to be speaking uh, to folks who I think uh, by and large are uh, coming in from the Pacific Northwest. I'm always fascinated by the Salish Sea uh, and our sister program uh, through the National Estuary Programs. Is, there's a big Puget Sound uh, National Estuary Program, uh, the Puget Sound Partnership. Uh, which uh, might prove to be a very big resource for many of you um, who aren't familiar with them already. Uh, but uh, with that, I think I'm ready to put up my my presentation and share my screen and get going. How, does that sound like the right thing to do? That sounds like the right thing to do. And I'll hide right. my video and let you take it away. All right. Very good. Thanks, Carly. Talk to you soon. Oh, Carly, you got to let me share my screen. Yes, I do. Um, so sorry about that. It's all right. This is one of those things with technology. All right, you should be good to go. <laughs> you have permission shot. to present. There we go. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, let's, and who knows, it'll be my turn to make the next, you know, sidestep here, so. I'm pulling off of too many screens. Ooh, let's do this one. All right, share. Perfect, is that a full frame picture for everybody? All right, that is a full frame picture on my end and looks fantastic. fantastic. 
All right, so uh, welcome to uh, my introduction to Giant Kelp Community Restoration, and uh, surely it is one uh, central aspect of our comprehensive approach to coastal management off the coast of California. Um, you know, not the most celebrated ocean. Uh, if, you, if you started asking people like, oh, where do you like to go? Where would you like to visit? Where would you expect to see rich, abundant, beautiful wildlife and natural heritage and a coastal culture that's rich? I don't know that LA comes to the top of a lot of people's lists. Um, it wasn't on mine when I moved here in 98. Um, it has become so in the 20 years or so that I've now uh, lived here. And um, I'm unduly impressed uh, with uh, the beauty that's off this coast um, and the need for, for our science to be applied um, and to build uh, the people and the multiple interests that uh, we've been able to assemble uh, to join us in, in trying to figure out how we're going to preserve and promote our, our coastal lifestyle. Um, and knowing that some of you may not be able to make it through this whole thing, I've got a few quick summary slides that will sum it up uh, and then you know the, the whole big show will start. So as my, as my early public speaking was, tell them what you're gonna tell them, tell them and tell them again. So we're gonna start with tell them. Uh, right. And that should advance. Did that advance? Not on the second screen. Am I still stuck on that first slide, Carly? It looks like we're still on the first slide for the introduction. Okay. Um, give, me, technology. <laughs> give me one second, because I'm pulling off of multiple screens. I might have to figure that out. Sorry, everybody. Um, one moment. Uh, now I got to pull back up Zoom. I do love this. I can see your desktop, I think. Okay. Pull back picture. <clears throat> One moment. I'm not even. Okay. Bear with me. And I would encourage everyone out there who's watching who maybe uh, isn't familiar with the Bay Foundation. Their website is a fantastic browse and great resource. I will plug that into the comments for anyone who is curious. They are based down in, uh, in Santa Monica and uh, a wonderful, wonderful resource. I get it. I'm hanging in there. We're, we're going to tech support here. <clears throat> okay. So, the, I mean, if the fact of the matter is I'm shooting from my coworker's place because my two rowdy children are rampaging my apartment. And this was the seemingly best solution. So it's supposed to be coming off of that screen yeah. and I can't get it to advance off of that screen. So if we maybe try to share this again and go to this screen would be the opportunity. So we got to pull up Zoom. Carly, if you don't mind, um, we're getting closer. No worries. All right. These things happen. One, screen one. Nope. Do this one. And no, it's thinking about it. screen sharing. Oh, uh, there we go. That looks to have worked. Okay. Do we have a new frame? We do. We do. Fantastic. Yeah. I think you may just need to make a full screen on your end. So presentation okay. mode. It should then let you yeah, click through. All right. Here we go. So close. <clears throat> ah, come on. I was thinking about it. <laughs> uh, why? Oh, these things I get, happen. Why, and this can't is, I get the whole screen? Come on. <laughs> this is the joy of uh, pivoting to digital presentations during oh. this time. And even in person, we have our fair share of, of happenings as well. 
I will say your presentation looks beautiful <laughs> from the frozen screen. We are full <clears throat> screen. That worked, Tom. Fantastic. Um, so for those of you that are still here, um, uh, this was, you know, sort of my, my summary top slide for you. Um, you know, kelp is declining uh, globally uh, in our temperate uh, oceans. We may be seeing declines in Arctic systems, uh, but they are less studied and I am less familiar with them. Uh, when we lose our kelp forests, uh, we're obviously often losing this tremendous vertical, uh, horizontal um, structure in the ocean waters, all those those big fronds of algae providing a, a home and shelter and opportunity to feed or uh, a surface area to apply uh, eggs to, um, you know, so many so many different things. Uh, so when we lose them, we're losing those ecosystem services. Uh, obviously, uh, we rely on our coastal oceans for a number of socioeconomic uh, outputs. Uh, a lot of fisheries um, are going to be utilizing. Um, <clears throat> organisms uh, that are that live in the kelp forest, at least for some part of their life history, uh, so they can be impacted. And um, as much as you know, the west coast of the United States is a pretty big place, uh, and we don't necessarily look at the loss of these systems. You know, to date, there's not a whole lot of conversations that I'm in, involved in where this is a food security issue, uh, but it's certainly a food security issue for folks with smaller coastlines uh, around. Uh, the the uh, around the planet um, who I interact with, uh, so um, you know very very serious business for sure. Um, the nice part is is that uh, our restoration efforts in Los Angeles, as well as several elsewhere that I'm familiar with, have really shown uh, that we can turn this around. That we know enough about this system, uh, and we know enough about the many stressors and impacts on it that we can turn the kelp forest back into something that's functioning better. Um, we also have an opportunity to address, uh, you know, climate change or use climate change adaptational approaches through uh, kelp forest restoration. Uh, so blue carbon, socioeconomic sustainability being enhanced. Um, and then we've realized uh, many years ago here in Los Angeles that making sure we had a big uh, community of people, um, many of the users uh, of, of the kelp forests involved in our planning and involved in our communications uh, so that they felt uh, that they were being heard, that their voices could help inform our approaches. And uh, we're certainly interested in now exploring ways uh, to scale this up. And uh, we're working with some interesting partners on various technologies and innovations to help expand our reach. So that's that summary uh, for you. And you know, if you've not seen an urchin baron before, this is a pretty decent image. I'm not an underwater photographer. Uh, you know, apologies for that. But here you're looking at something that we knew was a kelp forest uh, for at least 100 years, um, reduced to an urchin barren where there's urchins and rocks and not much else um, in the area. And by reducing those sea urchin densities, um, we can start to get our kelp forest back. We increase productivity, increased ecosystem structure and function. Uh, we attract a lot of animals. We're now producing a lot of animals as well as algaes. And in 2018, we keep on trucking. Uh, this time series continues to date, uh, but these are the most up-to-date that I have from this. Um, presumably, uh, we're shooting this from the same angle best we can um, over time in this one location. Uh, we do this throughout our, our various restoration sites, but uh, we've bounced back from tough winters, uh, hot summers, algal blooms. Um, so we're starting to see that resilience uh, that we want to see, as well as increased species richness and biomass. Um, so a lot of my talk will start to focus on that. Um, this might be a little heavy handed way to get in uh, to it. You know, the way I usually talk about it is exactly this. You know, kelp, I need somebody. Um, there is no doubt our coasts um, have endured a lot. And we, I, th I think as a society, um, at least uh, speaking for the United States, you know, just figured that the ocean, um, you know, could just bear these impacts um, indeterminably long. Um, and, you know, from a fishing perspective, I don't know, I just keep going out there and catching and the fish keep showing up. I think we've learned in the past uh, half century, uh, especially, that that's not the case. Uh, for those of you who haven't 
uh, had the opportunity to spend any time in a giant kelp forest, and in this case, a uh, giant kelp forest off the coast of Southern California. Uh, aside from all the scientific interests that I have in them and the excitement of studying them, um, they're just gorgeous. Uh, the light shooting down through those golden fronds um, at the surface. Uh, here's a shot from the bottom where we have a whole substory of algae. Uh, we can, you know, we start to get a good image of the rocks. The giant kelp is growing off the rocks up to the surface. Um, you know, currently um, at most times maximum depth of about 85 feet. Um, along the mainland coast, it's less than that. It's usually around 50. Uh, here's a snapshot of some of the fish uh, that we would expect to find in a healthy kelp forest off of our coast. Slightly larger fish moving into some of those mid-scale predators, um, in this case, uh, kelp bass. And uh, I think this shot also is a bit of a reminder that this is a very dynamic place physically. Uh, so we can start to see some of the wave action in the motion uh, in this shot on the substory algae, as well as some of that surf grass that you see in this frame. But unfortunately, in too many places that we go, um, instead of seeing all those fishes, um, all those algaes, I have scenes like this one uh, shot by my friend Tom Boyd, uh, where the algae, where the urchins have moved in. Uh, they exist in high concentrations, uh, easily an order of magnitude greater than what we would expect. Uh, they also exhibit strange or different behaviors uh, once they uh, are in these dense aggregations um, that then lead to uh, what has been defined as an ecological alternative state uh, that kelp forests can either recover from a disturbance and return to being a kelp forest or they can recover from a disturbance and become urchin barons. Uh, the second of the two, very different um, than the first when it comes to the number of species, the biomass and the productivity, which is where you know we came at this from uh, saying that we, we prefer the more productive state and we would like to see that, that state uh, returned uh, to our coast uh, so that those benefits that it provides um, can, can be realized. Oh, that's a good one. I always like that one. Uh, so uh, I did mention that you know, giant kelp um, or that, that kelp forest decline is a, is a global phenomenon. Um, and giant kelp has a pan-global distribution. Uh, you know, Aleutians, Gulf of Alaska, um, in some places off the Pacific Northwest, down the West Coast into uh, Northern Baja. And then we take a break and we hit it, pick it up in Chile. And then we can move from Antarctic Islands to South Africa, Australia, New Zealand. Um, really quite, quite a special um, algae. Um, to be sure. And uh, Darwin came across it um, on his voyage of the Beagle and said, wow, man, um, I, you know, he just, he just saw the neotropics. Uh, he, you know, I think cementing his theories on evolution on this voyage. And then he said, wow, you know, if, if, if ever this forest was destroyed, um, nearly so many species of animals perish. Uh, so, I think the diversity that he was able to witness from the side of the boat or maybe with a small sort of looking glass uh, facing down into the water off of uh, Tierra del Fuego um, really cemented with him as to how amazingly diverse and productive our kelp forests around our planet are. And the benefits to kelp forests are not limited to just where the kelp grows. Um, certainly the, the kelp, uh, giant kelp in Southern California, a given frond growing from the base to the surface lasts about six months um, and then it will break off. Um, during that time it'll slough and be broken into particulate organic matter and dissolved organic matter and it washes up on the beaches and it sinks down off of the continental shelf um, and it nourishes uh, species uh, on all sides of that. We're also interested um, and, grow and increasingly so in how uh, kelp may alter chemical and physical environment of the ocean where it is growing. And surely without giant kelp washing up on our beaches in Southern California, the, the insects that then feed on that kelp who then feed the migratory birds. Um, you know, big news today about the declines that we're seeing um, in, the, in the Pacific flyway are kind of foremost in my mind. Uh, so if we get kelp back, and this is why it's a central aspect of our comprehensive approach uh, to 
coastal management um, is because it just does. It, the, the kelp just keeps giving, um, even in death and even in decomposition. And for us as human beings, uh, and uh, this is John Erlinson's work and a, and a very quick summary of it, uh, but uh, you know, he was able to establish uh, through artifacts and interviews and, and more recently through some genetic work that was graciously allowed him um, by some of, some of the first peoples to come to this continent um, that you know, they had boats and technologies and were adapted to harvesting out of coastal um, near shore environments in Asia were able to make it across the Aleutians and down the coast into um, you know, North America and even into Northern Central America. And uh, so we referred to it as the kelp highway. And so I see this you know, as, a, as an issue and a modern um, environmental issue, but also something that we're very deeply connected to. Um, and that this is a cultural heritage that we share um, that has helped support human beings on this coast for um, uh, modestly 15,000 years, if not longer. So then taking a step forward from 15,000 or 10,000 years ago to 1911, um, and this is where uh, some of the data and the historical accounts of how much kelp used to exist off of Los Angeles, where I'm able to start to work um, with things to try to quantify what's happening. Uh, so this is uh, what I find to be a, a lovely map of uh, Palos Verdes, which is the southern rocky headland of uh, Santa Monica Bay in Los Angeles. Uh, it is about 17 miles um, around the peninsula itself. Uh, it has 120 to 150 foot tall bluffs that descend down from the highland um, to the rocky beaches, and then those rocky reefs extend offshore. And these large uh, brown uh, sort of polygons and yellow polygons you see here uh, were mapped out um, by the United States Army commissioned by uh, the Department of Agriculture to assess how much algae was growing off of our coast um, to try to help support the burgeoning agricultural boom um, that uh, the nation intended to, to see witness to, um, especially in the Midwest. Uh, this, and these, these were conducted all the way up um, into, uh, into Washington and into the Puget Sound Salish Sea system. And uh, I know that uh, biologists up there who pay attention to what's happening with the kelp um, also refer to these same surveys. Uh, for us, we want to make sure it was good data, came out to be that case based upon um, uh, some contracts that we put out to some folks. So we're confident that this is a reasonable baseline for us to start with now just under 100 years ago. Uh, because of the many different interests in kelp, uh, we've had opportunities, um, not in a really continuous time series, but a decent time series over the past century and into this century, um, looking at how much kelp was off the coast of Los Angeles. And by the time we move solidly into the post-World War II era, we start to see the kelp really drop off. Um, that weird spider leg that you see growing off the coast is the discharge from one of our sewage treatment plants. We've definitely seen sewage discharge negatively impacting kelp forests uh, due to the actual biosolids coming out of them and poorly uh, treated systems, the excess nutrification leading to other issues. Um, but long story short, moving into the late 50s, there's very little, if any, kelp left. Uh, surveys that were conducted in the mid to late 60s um, by uh, some of the pioneers of the work here in, in Southern California. I said, wow, there's two adult giant kelp plants left on Palos Verdes and there should be somewhere around a million and a half of them. Um, so that gives us an idea of how greatly impacted and how desperate things were uh, for the recovery of our kelp forests. So if I take those polygons, plot them out on this bar graph and then look at you know, a high that was recorded um, in 1928, that was sort of the maximum ever encountered. Uh, and I run that over time in general, uh, this rate of decline results in about an 80% reduction in the kelp canopy um, off the coast of California. Um, for those of you that are ocean-based people, you know that most folks look at the water and it looks the same regardless of what's going on underneath it. I think that's often a challenge uh, for ocean conservation practices because uh, the sea just kind of looks the same uh, for, for most. And, uh, you know, if we lost 80% of this forest or this grassland um, or this desert, 
uh, landscape in California, I'm sure that we'd be hearing a lot more protest from folks um, interested in its conservation, restoration, and preservation. So it's a bit of an outreach effort and a, commu and a communication challenge as well. Um, so then usually that results in, okay, the kelp went away. Um, we under I understand that it's important, uh, but what exactly happened? Um, why did it go away? And um, as is often the case in most environmental uh, situations, it's not a single cause. Um, you know, we've radically transformed uh, coastal Los Angeles County. It's now a giant urbanized landscape. Uh, we've altered the way the sediment moves, the nutrients move, the way the water moves. We've introduced a good chunk of the outflow of the Colorado River and other river systems um, that now flow through our homes, across our landscapes, and are discharged out into the bay. So the changes are profound, uh, without a doubt. Um, and, you know, 250 years of, of colonialization uh, and a, a different group of people coming um, to this land uh, with different ideas about their connection uh, to this land and how they managed and approached it as a result. I think we're dealing with facing those facts uh, right now. Uh, but for us, I think what I went back to in that trying to sort this out was, well, I'm losing kelp in the Aleutians. I'm losing kelp off the coast of Norway or the Canadian Maritimes or um, in New Zealand, and they don't have this same urban presence, that there might be something else that's going on that's more common. And uh, really what it comes down to, uh, and what I think a lot of our work points at, is that the loss of predators and competitors in this system um, has really driven this uh, at a local scale. And it isn't the discharge exclusively. This isn't a hopeless case um, that, you know, the Los Angeles coast has been so altered that we can't bring this back. Um, if we can clean up the water, if we can uh, deal with sea level rise and the erosional forces that uh, will come with that, uh, and if the kelp can hang on facing uh, some of the warmer water that we expect, um, I think we have a lasting solution here. And I'm encouraged to share this with others because uh, I think if you can get your ecology back, um, you can actually weather the storm quite well. Uh, so here's just a reminder again of what a, an urchin barren looks like rather than a nice robust kelp forest um, and really uh, you know a starting point on this trip. Sorry that would, the, that that picture you got snuck in there wasn't supposed to be there. Um, but uh, I mentioned that these the urchin barrens are an alternative stable state that they have permanence uh, and once established uh, these can stay around for decades if not upwards of a century and so again, we made a choice that we'd like to see if we could get our kelp forest back rather than having urchin barren dominated reefs off of California. So I'm just gonna pull all that up so we can look at it at the same time. Um, you know, we've lost uh, a number of our, our predators in this system um, or the remaining predators that are around in decent numbers are too small um, to effectively predate urchins. And um, a point that I will make right now and hopefully reinforce a little bit later is that urchins in urchin barrens being so calorically and nutritively de depleted, they just don't have access to calories and nutrition, that there's really nothing inside them. They're of interest to predators. So even if there's a million urchins there, they're empty eggshells sitting on the sea floor and no reason for a predator to really pay attention to them and try to predate them. Um, so uh, bringing the predators back or trying to enhance them, we can get there in some other ways. Uh, we're also very interested in looking at the competitors, and in this case, in reintroducing abalone into a meaningful and sustainable uh, population size off of our coast. Uh, as for sea otters, that's a, a often a very interesting conversation. We made them illegal uh, in Southern California. Um, we now have welcomed them back. Um, meanwhile, I don't think that our ecosystem is yet uh, really tuned up, at least the kelp forest ecosystem is really tuned up um, to support them in many places. Um, hopefully all of our work will get there. Um, so uh, potential fisheries losses and a lot of potential benefits. Uh, so these were modeled benefits that we derived from data that we collected um, when we defined the problem 
out here. And um, now we're really trying to test whether or not uh, the returns um, that we're seeing from this investment might actually approach those levels. Um, so got some more numbers and some more data uh, to come. And uh, when we started, uh, this was because I studied uh, kelp forests uh, as my in my graduate work at UCLA, and you know I was like, well, these barons are terrible. Um, they're awful. Uh, they don't work. And the folks that were issuing permits and starting to think about you know giving us the millions of dollars that we were going to need to spend to do this job said, well, how bad are they? And you know we'd love to see the data on that. I was like, well, let me go get it. Uh, but oddly, I don't know that I have any. Um, and it turned out that there was very little out there. Uh, so we turned around some quick grants, uh, went out there and conducted uh, a study to compare the reefs on Palos Verdes that were in Urchin Barren State to the reefs that were still supporting good, steady, stable kelp forests. And the data showed us quite clearly that there was a big difference between the barrens and the kelp forests. I'm going to flip through these pretty quick because I don't want to eat up all of our time uh, looking at 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 plots. But um, what I will say is that we, you know, we try to take this from the from the very bottom of the of the trophic levels on up to the top. So we're looking at those predators. We're looking at the algae. We're looking at the rocks. Um, the you know the sort of the key components uh, as well as species that are of particular interest um, to commercial and recreational fisheries. So uh, these were the values that we derived from looking at reefs um, that did not uh, that were barren, um, largely in the middle uh, portion of the frame. Over here is where this large contiguous section of barrens uh, occurred. Uh, we ha also have some points down here and down here that you'll become more familiar with that were also barren. Um, but yep, we had a lot more coralline, uh, crustose coralline algae. Um, where there aren't the kelp forests and it is an attractant um, for larvae to drop out of uh, the plankton. Um, so in a way, uh, a positive feedback loop for urchin uh, larvae returning to these reefs that are already barren. So uh, limiting the amount of crustose coralline algae out there um, arguably helps you. Um, certainly a very big difference in the, in the density of uh, purple sea urchins are our main purple urchin uh, issue here um, in our kelp forests versus our, our barrens. The macroalgae that they directly um, predate as well as grays certainly affected. Uh, the, there's a congener, uh, actually no longer, sorry, new genus. Um, the uh, red sea urchins, which are of commercial interest here in Southern California, um, they, they were also still significantly different between the barrens and the kelp, both in number and in condition, uh, which I'll get to a little bit later. Uh, our spiny lobster, and they are an urchin predator, and we found absolutely zero of them in these urchin barrens, which uh, when we initially mapped them, we estimated there to be you know, 10 million sea urchins, too many um, on those reefs. And even with all of that standing urchin, uh, again, because there's not much in there uh, for the lobsters to eat. They just sort of ignore them and the urchins are able to persist. Um, here's one of our generalist, uh, more generalist uh, predators, uh, California sheephead. It's a wrasse. Um, these guys seemingly make a living anywhere they go, uh, but even they uh, impacted um, and, dis and disproportionately present. And our kelp bass, which are fairly obligate um, adapted to living in and around uh, our, our kelp forest certainly also saw a big change. And this, this species in particular, very particular interest to our recreational fishing community. Uh, so some of these numbers flashed up on the screen earlier, uh, but we compared the values for what was in the kelp forest versus what's in the barrens. And uh, we were able to make the case that, hey, if this works, if we clear it out, um, we might actually get uh, to these values. Uh, so those early studies then helped set us up um, to select 10 sites um, in barrens that we were going to monitor before, during, and after uh, restoration. Those are these lighter gray uh, squares and again clustered in that central area where these urchin barrens uh, largely manifested um, compared to 10 other sites uh, that you see um, that are in 
uh, kelp forests around uh, the Palos Verdes Peninsula. And you can see a few of these smaller red areas. Uh, these red uh, polygons indicate the places that we mapped out the urchin barrens uh, on the peninsula. Uh, this was no small effort. Uh, you really can't use a lot of remote technology to do this. Uh, so teams of divers and folks on the surface with kickboards swimming around with GPS points mapping the periphery of these barrens. It took a, a solid six months to get this done. Um, and uh, the area itself is uh, roughly the size of a uh, small college campus, um, medium-sized college campus. So here's just a list of the points um, and uh, a couple of the controls, uh, which uh, we hope uh, to continue to restore uh, moving forward. One of the uh, one of the uh, cases that we made in this project was please don't let us, don't force us to leave an urchin barren behind. That could then lead to uh, an ex a point where more urchin barren could then manifest and start to grow from around the peninsula. We're really trying to address this complex of rocky reefs as a single unit. Uh, as for our, our restoration methods, um, we would find a barren. Um, we would look to uh, barriers for the physical incursion, uh, the locomotion of the urchins coming into uh, that area. If we had these physical barriers, we would put those to our back and initiate our work moving forward. Um, we loved to have that kelp line, which was that green polygon, because the spores of those kelp adults would then land on our reef and then give rise to that next generation. Um, urchins, uh, at least these two species, as well as many others, do not like crawling across sand. So sand was a good barrier, um, and so was the shoreline. Uh, so these were ways that we started to, you know, logistically move our way around. I got, you know, it was like military tactics uh, from from long long ago um, fought uh, wars. Uh, making sure we didn't get flanked, uh, setting up our lines um, and moving forward. Uh, we delineated things very specifically. Uh, we told our divers exactly where to go and they had a target density uh, to reduce the urchins to, um, which is roughly two per square meter, um, which at that value, other reefs in Southern California who only have urchins of around two per square meter really proved to be resilient over time. Uh, so that was the target that we went with. And our divers um, are under close watch. Uh, aside from telling them where to go, we are moving through those areas to delineate that. We go through there within a couple weeks of them doing the work uh, so that we can assure them and ourselves that they've hit that target density so that uh, we really do effectively and comprehensively move through these reefs. Here's two of our uh, longest standing divers, uh, Terry Herzik um, and his mate, Gary. Um, both of these guys have spent thousands of hours underwater uh, working with us, um, making, making progress. Um, here's a shot of one of our uh, divers moving through the really strange kelp forest that we had in 2016 um, end of 2015 when we had persistently uh, warm waters down here, um, you know, roughly 20 degrees uh, C around 70, 72 degrees Fahrenheit, even in the middle of winter, which is crazy unheard of. Um, so the kelp looked just weird. We didn't, it was, you know, Dr. Seuss zombie kelp. We really, frankly, never came up with a great idea um, as to what to call it. So if anybody's inspired on this, uh, on this line, you know, share that with Carly and, uh, and, and tell us if you've got a good name. Um, we also built off of a community of researchers. Uh, we didn't want to fall into that trap of saying, hey, uh, our stuff works great, believe us. Um, we went out and uh, found this team from Occidental College to go out and conduct this work independently um, so that uh, we could get an independent picture of, uh, of our relative success. Uh, so these folks count everything um, in the water column as well as along the benthos to characterize these sites. And here we are um, uh, having a few light moments um, in the midst of all of this. Uh, we've spent uh, close to 10,000 hours underwater restoring and monitoring um, to transform uh, 55 acres uh, back into kelp forest off of our coast. And here's a, a short video I've got for you that uh, should make you a little more familiar with what this work actually looks like.
I didn't know Ben added, added a soundtrack. <laughs> Right. Um, I hope that wasn't too stunningly loud. Um, my my colleague Ben just added added some music to that. Apparently, when I heard it earlier today, there was no soundtrack. Um, so uh, here's a, a close up uh, map of uh, some of our restoration sites. You see them. These are the green uh, tone uh, that's nested in this overall brown. Um, that brown color indicated the actual um, extent of the kelp canopy in 2018. Um, it was a big year for us. There was really strong bottom-up forcing after many years of really lean conditions. And we're pleased to see that the kelp not only just came back in our restoration sites, but um, elsewhere in a big way um, along the coastline. Uh, this also coincided with um, uh, a fairly large wasting event, meaning um, we had a lot of sea urchins uh, that died off um, due to a, a, a bacterial infection associated with the stressful conditions from that warm water, uh, which coincided um, with our restoration sites. And uh, you just got an idea of uh, how this all nested in uh, with some of these areas. So we were working and, you know, really in a lot of cases um, in the full extent of where the, the, the reefs actually manifest along our coastline. Um, here's a, a quick series of how we actually lay this out. Um, so we are using, um, you know, GIS and uh, GPS integrated uh, tracking. Um, any of the red segments, yellow, blue segments, uh, occasional green one that you see in here are 10 meter by two meter wide uh, segments of two meter by 30 meter length uh, transects uh, that we run. And we swim those comprehensively across these reefs to identify how many urchins we started with. And then after the teams come through, we go back out there and we swim a subset of those same transects and track to make sure that the density of the urchins was reduced uh, to where we would like it. So we never enjoyed seeing red um, and we wanted to see everything converted to blue. Um, meanwhile, we're working in a highly varied dynamic environment out there with different composition of the reefs and sand channels and high relief, low relief. There's a lot going on, um, but i uh, been very proud of how this really helped us manage and learn from this project. Uh, and in total 55.2 uh, acres and over 4 million sea urchins that we've actually smashed with hammers um, to make this progress. Um, here's uh, one of our most recent sites that we're working with, uh, and this has now taken on uh, a new interest. Uh, we, we really didn't have the surf community too much involved with our work in the past, but um, certainly they enjoy the glassy conditions on the inside um, with the kelp forest on the outside. Um, so now uh, those folks are stepping up uh, voluntarily offsetting their personal carbon emissions by investing uh, in our kelp restoration work. Uh, so we're really starting to find a community-based way to initiate uh, some blue carbon type strategies uh, to support this work. So White's Point, here we go. And again, uh, to highlight where we're at, 67.8 urchins per square meter um, in the start, uh, and we're getting them down to 1.3 um, moving across this landscape. So one of the questions that often comes up is like, okay, I get it, uh, I can grow back, um, but how fast does this happen? Um, there should be no music associated with this one, um, but I'm gonna mute my computer just in case that helps. And uh, I'm gonna give you a time series and I'll do a little voiceover for you um, oop, of, this, of this video. I don't think it does, I could be wrong. Um, let's try, let's try keeping the mic alive here a little bit. Oy. Sorry, I'm. Here we go, folks. Apologies. <clears throat> uh, so this was a, a time series of a barren that we hadn't cleared 
a site where we removed urchins, um, followed by another site where we removed urchins. Um, this is that you know, bare rock, uh, some crustose and articulated coral analogies, which are you know, algae that armor themselves uh, with calcium carbonate to help uh, reduce abrasion and herbivory. Um, they're one of the few things that can stand up to uh, that, that presence of the urchins. Um, but even after 12 days, uh, as this indicates, um, of us moving through, you can see that the rocks are getting browner, getting shaggier, um, that the, the release from that herbivory predation and the, even the abrasion of the urchins moving across the landscape um, being eliminated or reduced um, has really started to allow things to take off quite quickly. Giant kelp plants um, that are mature adults, meaning, you know, 50 feet in length and maybe, you know, uh, 25 to 30 of these fronds growing from their hold fast to the surface and you know, can lay on a foot to two feet in growth a day. Um, this, this algae, you know, is adapted to this frequently disturbed habitat. And so when conditions are good, it knows how to go for it. And within 111 days, you go from urchin barren to a kelp forest stretching to the surface, in this case, in about 15 feet of water. And we're already attracting uh, fishes to this environment. Those are uh, senoritas cruising by. Hi. Uh, time series of photographs taken through these uh, various sites over time. So this is the same uh, cove uh, where that video was shot. You can see where things were at in, uh, in July 2014, uh, what they looked like um, in August 2014. Um, I think that that's, I, I, I want to say that's actually, that's a typo. That should be 2015. Um, and then here we are in 2016, um, subsequent to those really uh, warm temperatures that I talked about. We can still see a, a number of substory algae here, but the giant kelp had not yet rebounded from that. Uh, another site further north, uh, Honeymoon Cove, um, same approach, clear out the urchins, take advantage of those physical barriers, enhance spore settlement, recruitment, and hopefully they develop and grow to the surface. And um, this one, my personal favorite, uh, Marguerite, um, you know, there's 30 foot rock pinnacles and 20 foot cliff faces uh, throughout this site. Um, interestingly, we had a landslide uh, just up coast of this, um, it got really mushed by a bunch of sediment, scoured out the lower channels, a lot of fines suspended in the water, um, which really reduced um, the permanence of that initial um, response. Uh, but now that that, now that that landslide's moving through the water, we see the kelp coming back on this site. I can't wait to see this one over the course of years. And, uh, you know, here we are looking at um, you know, some of the data that we collect, uh, and this is on, on our urchins, um, underwater arch, honeymoon, Hawthorne. Uh, those are three of our restoration sites, ridges north, Rocky Point north, Point Vicente west. Uh, these are three of our reference sites. And uh, what we can see is that, um, you know, we, we actually had a decent number of these red urchins. Um, everybody died off uh, with this uh, with this event that we had of, of mass wasting. Um, but uh, what, what we did have for there momentarily was you know, some, some, some recovery from our work. Um, you can say the same uh, for, for our giant kelp plants up here in the upper right corner. Um, you know, we had very little to zero in our restoration areas after we restored them. We start to see increases. We saw that warm temperature drive them down uh, in some cases, we're still waiting to see the rebound, um, as in this site at Hawthorne. Um, so everybody was kind of tracking together on this one. Uh, nonetheless, we went from you know zero kelp in our restoration sites um, to starting to see that recovery fairly profoundly after uh, some of our restoration work. Um, we're still looking at that big reduction in purple urchins that we created, um, and then that has um, persisted in some of these kelp areas. So if these values down here resemble, resemble these values down here and stay there, um, that will be a good indication for us that um, either us or disease have been able to uh, limit the, the, the density of these urchins on these reefs. 
As for our lobster, um, this picture comes in a little clearer um, for this time series. Uh, again, the, the green ones, ridges, Rocky Point, Point Vicente are uh, where kelp had grown um, and had been growing um, our, our reference points and our blue sites being a suite of our restoration sites. And you can see, you know, no lobsters, no lobsters. Oh, you know, one lobster on a hundred square meter uh, transect um, and then fairly large increases thereafter as fewer urchins actually still means more opportunity uh, for these lobsters to actually prey. Uh, here we go with our with our sheephead. Um, so we're seeing some nice increases in them uh, in our restoration sites um, and some really noisy patterns in some places. Um, I think we've also realized that as much as we might look at Palos Verdes as one you know, contiguous reef system, um, these various coves and points um, really do have some very different patterns when it comes to these animals. So we've uh, really started to learn a lot um, about our, our local ecosystem and the distribution of these, of these fishes, um, which uh, I think I'll just lead to some more research and some more questions. Um, and speaking of, uh, of more research and more questions. Uh, when we first proposed uh, doing this work, um, the, a lot of the fishermen in our area said, whoa, man, you're gonna smash all these sea urchins and those are what I collect to pay my mortgage um, and you know, feed my family. And uh, I'm, not, I'm not so sure that you're, <laughs> what you're talking about something I'd like to get behind. Um, so it took a little while um, and it took uh, some data collection uh, to show them that you know, these barons were full of urchins that were of no uh, value to their fishery, um, that we could convert these areas back into kelp forests, which would have fewer, but better urchins in them. And uh, we figured out uh, along that path um, that they were the right people to bring in to actually be the ones that conducted the restoration um, themselves of this, uh, of this coastline um, that they could then go back out and harvest from and uh, in, in doing so, uh, create a, an involvement in, in an environmental project, uh, a stewardship and an ownership for the landscape that they're working on, and I think a, a better appreciation for the ecology um, than they had at the start. Um, so it's been great working with them, and I think we're actually you know, challenging um, a lot of ways uh, that uh, fishermen are involved with this type of work, uh, at least in California. Uh, so a, a bit to show you, um, you know, what, what information we use to help convince these folks um, to, to come along with us on this one and um, to, if not participate, at least support the work that we were trying to conduct. Uh, so we, we, we gathered a lot of urchins out there in order to generate an index um, of their condition um, specific to uh, the uh, specific to Palos Verdes. Uh, here you're looking at, you know, some really simple um, visuals to help convey that. Um, if you were a red sea urchin in the kelp forest getting a lot of kelp, you could grow big gonads. Uh, if you were in a barren, you had little gonads in comparison. Um, and for those of you that aren't in the know when you're ordering uni, um, you are eating either the ovaries or the testes of these species. Um, and it is really about the only thing inside uh, or comprising uh, a sea urchin that um, ourselves or other or other animals really would find as uh, as a source of uh, of nutrition. Uh, so we took our abundances, and I showed you those data very early on. Uh, we looked at the frequency as well as the size distribution of the urchins uh, on the reef. Uh, then we started looking at the gonad weight compared to the diameter of the urchins that were out there, and having run this model, we're able to produce a con, an idea of how much biomass might be available to the fishery. Like, could this project benefit the fishery uh, was a big question. And after we did all of that and ran those numbers, um, what we came out with was a, a modeled 883% increase. Uh, so the fishermen who I think were resistant at first um, certainly uh, got very excited um, that this might materialize. Their question was, how fast and uh, that perfect question. Um, and I think uh, our observations um, suggest uh, that we're looking at somewhere around eight months uh, to 18 months um, where urchins that were of little to no value are actually then um, maturing 
um, into a size and a condition that uh, they're interested to the fishery. Uh, here's some more data on, on our urchins uh, that are out there, um, some more size classes and counts. Um, but what we're starting to see is that our restoration urchins, um, the green ones here, um, the blue ones here are certainly um, a bit bigger um, than the ones that we find in the barrens um, and that we're seeing this distribution start to move, uh, at least in the case of the purples, um, to these, these larger size classes. They're a little bit bigger. They're getting some more food. Um, they're doing a bit better. Um, the Gannato somatic index uh, on these is looking at the size of the urchin and the proportion of that urchin's overall weight. That is actually the gonad. Um, so in this case, this tells the story, I think a bit clearer. Um, our kelp red urchins and our restoration red urchins um, do not fall out. Um, statistically, they are the same. Meanwhile, the barren urchins are still uh, very low below the same, uh, the value that we see with the kelp and the restored red urchins, uh, this pattern. Um, not as solid with the purples, we see you know, a little, little less uh, correlation in the restoration to the kelp um, in this case, but uh, uh, the barons are still well below the other two. Uh, so this leads us into a few other places that are coming up next. Um, you know, do the kelp forests dampen wave energy? Um, can they, uh, we know that large kelp forests, slow currents, um, they may, that may cause uh, sediment and nutrients to drop out, may even improve water quality uh, related to, uh, uh, to bacteria. Um, we're interested to see if there's stratification that's manifesting in these kelp forests differently than neighboring waters where there aren't kelp forests. Because they grow so fast, they pull so much CO2 out of the ocean water um, that they may actually effectively drive um, pH, D, uh, pH values upward. Um, and we've got some initial values that show that, yeah, they do. Um, we're trying, uh, we're looking uh, to our, our good colleague um, who's working on her PhD right now. Um, she's been researching this uh, for a few years with us. Uh, her studies are in, in preparation uh, or in, in the process of publication um, that really indicate that, hey, wow, you know, we can bring the pH up if we've got kelp around. And I know that's not um, unknown um, in other places and up in the Pacific Northwest as well. Uh, next steps for us, uh, you know, coming up with a good sound quantification for carbon sequestration uh, values or rates and the pathways of that. Um, so this is uh, the last uh, piece of what's new and I'm getting close to the end here, folks. Um, now, yeah, a lot of species will come back when we restore the kelp forest. Uh, they will be attracted to it if they like the neighborhood, maybe they'll stick around and produce the next generation. Um, that's not gonna happen for our abalone. Um, they are too few and far between. Um, and we are involved in the restoration of, of some of the species that occur off of our coast. And we're certainly involved in recovery efforts for one of the species that's endangered off of our coast. And this is a lovely picture from inside our lab of one of our white abalone uh, grazing on some kelp um, as we're culturing um, these uh, animals in order to get them ready to then be moved out into uh, the ocean to reestablish their population in Southern California. Um, trying to go back to sort of where we started on this, um, you know, we lost those predators. Uh, the auditors were cleaned out in the 1850s, virtually uh, throughout um, the, the West Coast of North America. And uh, that led to a trophic cascade. Uh, we see remaining predators in the system uninterested in urchin barren urchins who are too small to effectively predate on them. And the abalone in this case are a competitor for food and space with urchins and we've lost them as well. So we really lost a lot of what made this ecosystem tick. And uh, we're just trying to reset that clock and try to get this thing headed back in the right direction. I think our early results in this case um, show that that's happening. Um, we're not um, we're not unmoved uh, by the cumulative impacts of other multiple stressors, but uh, through our work and that of our many partners, um, there's an investment of billions of dollars uh, that has been going on in Los Angeles to improve our water quality off of our coast. It is certainly enabling uh, this work to be realized. We really couldn't get there without it. Um, 
we're keeping a close eye on what climate change is throwing at us um, to make sure that we're still uh, working in the right places uh, with the right idea here. Um, hopefully, uh, we stay ahead of that of those some of those signals and can maybe uh, weather the next century or so uh, on that front. And I already mentioned the trophic cascades and the loss of competition. Uh, here's a here's a list of the you know of our of our funders and our partners. Um, um, there's certainly a few people um, that could also made this list as well, but these are definitely the big players. Um, as I as I steal the uh, the line that uh, takes a village to raise a child, it takes takes a navy uh, to restore a kelp forest. And uh, in that, I think that's a a cautionary tale that um, we should work very hard to maintain and manage uh, these these kelp forests before you get to this point and then have to try to generate uh, the interest uh, in, in order to execute the work, uh, in order to bring them back, uh, which <laughs> to sound contrary to that, I've loved doing this. Um, this has been, um, you know, uh, 20 years of a trajectory with my career, um, uh, bringing people along, getting them to learn about and love kelp forests, and then showing them that we can save them, giving people that experience that you changed the planet in a very discernible way. Um, and, and I think also some of the real charm in that is you know, the, the kelp forests don't express their gratitude to you. Um, so it's a really wholesome uh, way uh, for a human being um, to acknowledge their role in this natural world and to find a way uh, to give back. Um, so that's the end of my presentation and my prepared comments. And uh, there's my email address in the, in the lower left corner uh, for any of you that like to follow up with me, please do. And uh, with that, I think Carly and I are going back to jointly sharing this and um, moving on to some questions and answers. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much for starters, Tom, for a wonderful presentation with a beautiful, beautiful message at the end. I learned a lot. I'm hoping that folks out there also learn quite a bit. Uh, I'm encouraging everyone to leave their questions and comments now. For Tom, we already had a couple roll in, so we'll we'll just dive into some of these questions. Um, yes. Benjamin is asking, I'll just read his full comment. He says, thanks, Tom, great presentation. Can you speak to the pros slash cons of kelp as an aquaculture crop and how this states that allow commercial kelp harvesting are working with the kelp farmers to encourage restoration efforts? That's, um, thank you, Benjamin, that's a great question. Um, I think there's, uh, there's a couple ways that this has started to manifest. And uh, really, I think uh, the Puget Sound system, Salish Sea, uh, I'm not sure which is the common vernacular up north uh, these days, um, but where we started to see a real um, loss of production with the oysters um, that are so um, synonymous with aquaculture in that region and that current ocean acidification values were starting to cause problems with the oysters. So hey, cultivate kelp in conjunction with the oysters, we can raise the pH of the ocean, the kelp will break down and provide food for the oysters and then everything starts to improve. Um, for a long time in some cultures, you know, thousands of years, there's a history of eating allergies. Um, it's starting to catch on um, as I think many people are trying to find a way to eat lower on the trophic uh, web. And uh, there's a lot of aquaculture interests. I saying we'd love to grow, uh, we want to grow algae. Um, and some of the issues associated with historically over harvesting our natural kelp forests are all in play in this permitting process. Uh, so there's a lot, there's a lot of give and take going on and there's a lot of considerations. Um, what I can say is it seems that there's few places um, along a, the majority of the West Coast of the United States where these, these aquaculture farms may be successful just because of the exposure of these open coastlines. Um, the, those protected waters uh, that are more char uh, characteristic of British Columbia um, and the Salish um, might provide more opportunity. Uh, so I, I don't want to, I hope I'm not beating around the bush too much. It's a big question that you asked. Um, certainly I enjoy eating algae. I encourage people to eat algae. It's definitely um, got some great health benefits and um, it's, 
And uh, I think that it can be cultivated in a very sensitive um, and conscientious manner and, and really add to what we're trying to produce through aquaculture. So um, I'm all down for it. Excellent. We have a question in here from Adam Obeza, who actually presented with us last month uh, and connected us with the Bay Foundation through um, Powo Marine Research Group in Southern California as well. And Adam says, Tom, would you think this approach could work in Puget Sound if herbivores, like kelp crabs, are identified as reducing kelp habitats? This is presuming kelp crabs were released from mm -hmm. predation from removal of predators like rockfish. And he also adds, also, do you want to come visit kelp forests in Puget Sound with us and count baby rockfish? <laughs> yeah, so we were uh, we were just on the boat last week together, um, all masked up and staying as far apart as possible. Um, and yeah, I'm I can't wait to get up to the Puget Sound system um, and and able to support. Uh, Adam and his partner Amanda's work up there. Um, I'm, Adam, I thank you for the, the for the. Uh, I hadn't heard um, of concerns about um, sort of maybe population management of kelp crabs um, impacting uh, kelps uh, in in the Salish system. So I'd I'd be more than happy to follow up with you a bit further on that because I don't know that I have an easy uh, answer for you right now. Um, certainly, we've seen some very interesting rare and episodic events of uh, amphipods um, having a population explosion and grazing uh, the standing kelp down to, you know, bare rock uh, here. So I'm, you know, maybe I'm, I hope I'm not stretching the line too, too thin uh, to pull crabs and amphipods into that same uh, aggregation, but uh, perhaps the more generalist answer to this is that I believe that our coastal systems have been profoundly altered. And that's from historical inputs as well as ongoing um, stressors. And if we just decide to do nothing, I don't think it's the right path forward. So we need to figure out how we're gonna own up to the imbalances that we've created. Um, it'll make, it'll, it'll definitely lead to some hard choices, uh, but hopefully good science will inform those choices and we can make some smart management decisions. Uh, so. Um, I'm looking forward to catching up with you this week, next week on this. Um, thanks for introducing the idea to me. Excellent. And I always love when, um, when we can have that connection and folks who tune in who we've maybe worked with we before or toss that ball your way as well. You have, uh, you have quite a handful of fan people <laughs> commenting on doing a great presentation. A couple of people who um, are having a little bit of nostalgia. They lived in this area at one point. Um, I actually have a question just about what your biggest takeaway from this restoration project has been or the biggest lesson that you've learned over this time. Or in, wow. I can pluralize that too. That's there's heavy. multiple lessons. <laughs> yeah, no, there certainly is. Um, um, you know, what I think I was, I was pretty confident that we were going to get the response uh, from the ecosystem that we got. Um, and I, and I don't mean to diminish that because it alone would be worth it. Um, but what I've been perhaps more personally impacted by um, has been the response of, of people who have been involved in this project or have learned of this project and how it's uh, created for them uh, a, a, an acknowledgement that we all have enough power and capacity um, to take baby steps as my, as my friend, Terry, uh, my commercial fisherman restoration engineer puts it. Um, and, um, and we turned, we turned LA around and we made strong friendships in that regard. And we are now, you know, informing uh, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife and federal agency on how we can manage these landscapes and create opportunities for an endangered species to come back. Um, and it's really been a story about people um, in the end. And without with taking the opportunity to get on my soapbox here for a second, Carly, um, and I think that you know global climate change, global drivers, 
all this is still going to come down to a series and hopefully a, an absolutely um, comprehensive approach to a, the application of a serial uh, set of, of, but what are going to be local projects. They're going to be local projects. Um, and, uh, you know, this should be a recognition that, you know, the folks in Seattle, the folks out on the peninsula, uh, the folks, you know, down to everybody's got a place where they can go find that they love, that they value, and they can make that connection and start to whip up, um, you know, the, the, the necessary information and interest to turn it around. And um, in, a, in a, what's been a really tough year, um, this has been a bright light for us to point a lot of people at and say, yeah, we certainly can. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's helped, it's helped through some of the darker times of 2020 for sure. Absolutely. And well said, I think that rolls into one of our next questions that, uh, that, that ties together what you said, but also what our mission statement at Harbor Wild Watch is. We want to inspire stewardship for the environment for the Salish Sea and Greater Puget Sound. And I'm curious what you might think uh, is the most impactful way we as individuals can help kelp forests in either Puget Sound, Southern California, or maybe our backyard is further than that, and and we want to we want to leave an impact um, and help the kelp. What do you what do you think would be the best way we as people can do that? Well, I th the uh, you know from from maybe a couple different entry points. Um, you know, certainly for our modernized society, um, you know how we move ourselves around and what we choose to consume um, in our food and beverages um, is is where you can really take a hard swing at your carbon footprint. And reducing your carbon footprint is something that we should all be working on and taking pride in um, switching to a mostly vegetarian diet for me was not an easy thing. I don't know. I wouldn't say that I wasn't unwelcome to it, but damn, I miss cheeseburgers. Um, but you know, there you go. Uh, you know, that's kind of the effort that you need to take. Um, you know, we work in a system uh, where our coastal watersheds are obviously directly connected uh, to what is um you know, are, are receiving waters at the bottom of those. And I'm familiar with some of the efforts um, to improve the condition of the watersheds that drain into the Puget Sound and the Salish. In fact, uh, you folks lead the nation, if not have provided some amazing internationally, um, international leadership on that matter. Uh, so uh, own those projects, learn from those, become part of that, that plan, that movement, and demand that your town city be next. Um, and uh, I've also been impressed, so very impressed um, with uh, the inclusion of the, of the First Nations, um, the region and how, how, how powerful they've been in, in, in informing and, and gathering that perspective. So I, I've, got, I've got high hopes for you guys up there. And uh, yeah, you and your neighbors are are the ones that are changing the course of history in your local landscape. So um, get together, talk about it, and and just move through it stepwise and make it better. Absolutely. I got a long list of specifics, but boy, we'd have to we'd we'd have to just hang it up and go for another ten hours here. <laughs> No, I think that answer was perfect um, and, and so true. I think we're going to wrap up with, uh, with one more question. I should also credit that question back to our executive director, uh, Lindsay. But the, the next question I have for you um, is from Eric, and he's asking if you're familiar with any sort of uh, historic kelp bed in the Puget Sound area, specifically the Dumoulin sand spit that was mowed off. He's, I think he's asking that generally if anyone is familiar with that, but mm -hmm. curious if you've heard anything about that area. No, I've, no, I've not. Um, and I, and I don't, I don't want to pretend to, to be an expert in, in what's happening in your region. Uh, the little bit that I've been exposed to it is um, there seems to be shifts happening in where kelp had historically grown to where it is now 
growing. Um, there seems to be um, some really interesting changes happening up uh, near the um, in the in the northern um, passages uh, up inside uh, Vancouver Island, where the water just seems to be you know warm and stratifying, and a lot of things are changing more rapidly there. Uh, but uh, the values in you know canopy of kelps um, from the last few years that I've seen seem to be holding pretty steady and seem to be pretty relatively steady compared to what they were in 1911. Um, so those same surveys, you know, you guys are, are holding on comparatively strong. Um, so maybe another underlining for why making the push now is the right time for you. Cause I think there's still enough intrinsic pieces um, that, you know, the improvements that you would like to see are tenable uh, and that you guys can actually, you know, get it done. And, and it sounds like, you know, Harbor Wild Watch and, and, and that big community of folks out there who love those waters that are really such a part of, of your, of who you people identify as um, are, are really getting after it. So I'm just, I'm just pleased to have been a part of it tonight and happy to uh, support you indirectly. And if uh, any of our work um, can be of application, you know, you've, you've got my number, Carl, or whomever else can reach out and um, be happy to continue to help support what you're trying to accomplish. Wonderful. That uh, sounds great. And I, if folks want to get a hold of you, Tom, what is, what is the best way for them to do so or learn about the Bay Foundation and their uh, efforts and projects? Uh, so uh, my, my email is T as in Tom Ford. So T Ford at Santa Monica Bay dot org our website is www.santamonica.org um, and uh, we're going through that oh so pleasant of experience of redoing the website this year so um, stay tuned um, it works great now but we can't wait to um, have uh, our website ready for for a more modern world um, in, a, in a summer of about 12 months um, and as you, uh, someone involved with the communications, Carly, and you understand how important a hub that can be for everybody. Uh, so um, tune into us, check it out. And um, uh, more so, I uh, can only encourage you to just stay focused at home and, um, and keep, keep making it better. Awesome. Well, for those who want to learn more about Harbor Wild Watch, our website is harborwildwatch.org. You can always feel free to ask questions to Tom directly or email us at info at harborwildwatch.org. I also would be remiss if I didn't plug our annual fundraiser coming up in just a week here. We've done, uh, we've, we've gone digital with it this year. So we will be hosting Make Waves next Thursday, September 24th, and it is free to register. So you can feel free to Fantastic. check out the comment section, click into that um, and learn how you can donate and support environmental education with Harbor Wild Watch for more digital programs similar to these and making these happen. Otherwise, I think I'm going to call it an evening and sign off here with Tom. Thank you again so much for joining us this evening and such a wonderful, insightful, and inspiring, quite frankly, presentation. We really appreciate you joining us. All right. Well, thank you, Carly. It was a pleasure to be here and uh, best of luck with your fundraiser next week. Thank you so much. All right.